Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to Wednesday Inspiration from North Congregational Church for October the 12th, 2022. I'm the Reverend Dr. Mary Piedren. I'm the Senior Minister of North Church, and I am here with another installment in our looking at the characteristics of love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 7, no, not 7, 4 through 7. I'm going to read this again today from the Contemporary English Bible, um, a modern translation, not especially different from some of the other contemporary translations, but I always am interested to see how different word choices can affect how we understand a particular passage. So Paul says, love is patient, love is kind, love isn't jealous, it doesn't brag, it isn't arrogant, it isn't rude, it doesn't seek its own advantage, it isn't irritable, irritable. it doesn't keep a record of complaints, it isn't happy with injustice, but is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So these are the characteristics of love, and today we're thinking about how love is not arrogant. Now, you might say, wow, that's kind of an interesting concept. I mean, we all know sort of what arrogance is, right? It's a, it's a self-involvement. It's a, it's a belief that, um, that, that you're better than other people. And love is not that. Love doesn't encourage us to believe that we're better than other people. Now, what that looks like is not just a, well, you know, I'm good at, at, at golf and you're not. It is really a self-centered way, a very particular kind of self-centeredness, a self-centeredness that not only makes yourself bigger, but devalues other people. And I came across an article written by the wonderful preacher and blogger and essayist Nadia Baltz Weber. And if you've ever not seen her work, you should take a look, B-O-L-Z or dash W-E-B-E-R. So Nadia is writing also about this whole idea of what it is that we use to puff ourselves up. How does this happen? And she talks about how we get to the point of thinking that we are better than other people. And she's asking, what exactly is it in us that is, that is being hooked by manipulated messages. She's thinking especially of social media, but also of many other ways that we are put, um, putting ourselves in contrast with others. To state it more theologically, she says, what sin is operative here? And then she cites a couple of, of other bloggers and says, I enjoy their ideas of sin as a flaw in the human system, a flaw that consistently causes errors in our relationship with each other the plan ourselves, the planet, and God. So, right? Sin is being out of right relationship with anything or everything. This sin is like a loop inside us, she says, that manipulated messages on social media hooks into and then pulls us apart from our best selves and from each other. Were I to name the loop, the thing inside us that gets so easily exploited, Nadia says, I would say it is our need to think of ourselves as good. More specifically, our need to think of ourselves as better than others. I know I myself devour anything that gives me that little self-righteous dopamine bump. I love that stuff like chocolate. Delicious. So we feel these things. We experience these things. These are part of the world in which we live. And we know it when we see it in others, the arrogance. We say, whoa, they're arrogant, they're stuck up. But also, in many ways, we don't even try to name it. We just think it. And yet, right along with that naming is the correlative thing of saying, well, I'm not like that. I'm not this way. I'm not that kind of person. I am just fine. And thank goodness I'm not as bad as that one. Thank goodness I'm not as low as they are. Thank, thank God that I am better than this poor sinner, as a Pharisee in one of Jesus' parables says, instead of this tax collector. The tax collector, on the other hand, chose to say to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, which one is, went away justified? Which one went away with the idea that they were really more at one with God? Now, this is all sin, and you recognize it because it diminishes our sense of being at one with other people and instead causes us to think that we are superior 
to others and to make superior judgments. And we'll get into this in some of the other traits that love is not like, like being rude. But it is, it is when we not only see it directly, but even attribute it to other people. The example of someone driving a car and they cut you off and the whole story you tell yourself is about how stupid and awful and bad they are and how right you are. So here's the thing about that. You could be wrong. Every time that I have ever in traffic believed I was completely right, utterly right, why are these people like that? I have discovered that I'm doing things like going wrong way on a one-way street or turning into the exit instead of the entrance or another one of those things that in fact, it is my own action that is the blinded one. It is my own action that assumes how right I am. Our arrogance substitutes a sense of superiority, superiority that we hold, a superiority over others, over some others, over all others. And it, it contrasts that with the way that we see how we are. And our vision when we make ourselves out to be superior is interesting. Because we are transactional, that means that only when you're superior are you good. Only when you're superior are you worthy. We have all heard this message. We have all heard that it only matters if you get A's in school. It only matters if you are the winner. It only matters if you are the one who comes in first. It doesn't matter about all the others. All the others are just losers. And you're a loser too if you lose. But God calls us to a different way. I thought about this when one of my daughters was in cross country. So cross country, particularly for girls, is a very grueling sport. It involves lots and lots of training. It's lots and lots of miles. You are not running on beautiful level tracks. Track is a whole other creature and also very grueling, but in a different way. But in cross country, you have uphills and downhills. You have to avoid roots. You have to do straight outs where when you have no more energy left, you have to run as hard as you can. And the other thing about cross country is it can take a long time. I've got sort of a little sunlight speckles. It can take a, a long time for you to finish. You can feel like a loser. So one of the things that struck me so deeply, why I was glad that we were involved with this sport, was cross country, first of all, is scored not by the excellence of the best runner, but by the field, by the, the, the finishes of everybody, by the way that everyone has done, by the way that everyone has done not necessarily the best, but good enough, good enough by how hard they have tried. And at the meets, all of us, the parents from both teams would go down towards the finish line. We would station people at the really difficult places. We would cheer on our runners. We would cheer on all runners. And we would go down to the finish line and we would cheer on our team and we would cheer on everyone as they finished. And we would stay joined by the girls who were done to cheer on the very last person because they were just as valuable and just as worthy of cheers as the first. So my friends, this is the part of what the gospel is about. And I'm going to go back to Nadia Boltz Weber because a little further on in this article, she talks about our need for hope. We all need to have hope. We all need to have hope that we're not losers. We need to have hope that even when things don't seem to be going right at all, or we don't seem to be doing well, that somehow all is not lost. And in fact, that hope is the gospel. That is what we are called to hope in, that beyond everything, there is resurrection, that beyond even death, there is some sort of restoration. So Nadia talks about how, she says, I am desperate for hope right now, real hope. I don't see much of it on the internet. Boy, is that true. If you're ever on Twitter, I finally have really backed off on Twitter, but it's hard all over the place. I don't see much of it on internet, but I do see it in my actual neighbors. I see it in the moments I break down and finally apologize for something I was really hoping to pawn off as someone else's fault. I see it in the moments of humility even though what I am most drawn to is pride. That is why the great human com competition extravaganza is spiritually meaningless. Don't you love that? The great human competition extravaganza. That's what we're all living. It's meaningless because God isn't ranking anyone. 
The gospel confronts us in our presumed virtue and says, you do not need to rely on your ability to be better than others. Lay down the ranking system. Walk away from your projects of self-perfection. None of it matters. You can stop trying to earn by comparison what has already been freely given to you, your freedom, your blessedness, your right to be loved. The church in Corinth needed to hear this because they were struggling with how people who were high in society would sometimes at communion have to serve people who they considered to be the lowest of the low. They were struggling with why they couldn't come early and get the best refreshments and leave the dregs for everybody else who was less worthy, less excellent, less fantastic than they. But the gospel says we are all one in the spirit. And what Paul was writing to them was, you are called to show love because only love can fulfill hope. Only love is the end of faith. Only love is what God is wishing on the whole world in equal portions, not proportionally to our skill or our excellence or our beauty or our speed or anything else, but because we are there, because we are running the race. And so, just as he said to the Corinthians, we also need to rely on only love, love that will carry us through, love that will cause us when we start saying, oh, that person is acting like such a dope to think, you know, I'm pretty dopey myself for thinking that. Only love is going to save us from our own sense that we are so much better that we don't need to associate with other people, that we don't need to do certain things, that somehow we are the worthy ones and the others, therefore, are unworthy. In God's economy, not our transactional world, but in God's economy, no one, no one is unworthy. We are all hot messes. You know I say that all the time. We are all God's beloved hot messes. God doesn't care if we are perfect. God just calls us to be faithful and loving. And we can do that with God as our helper. We just have to let go of that sense of our own superiority. So I chose a hymn for today, and it's got the words up because they're pretty relevant. I hope that you can, can read them. They might be kind of small. But it is the hymn, we have, you have come down to the lake shore, and it talks about the kind of people that Jesus called. Because if you remember, he called tax collectors. He called fishermen. He called people who were so messed up they weren't sure which way was up. He called people who had been demon-possessed. Those are our faith ancestors. Those are the people who encourage us to go on even when we are hot messes. After the hymn, we will come back for a time of prayer.
O oh, Jesus, you have looked into my eyes. Kindly smiling, you have called out my name. On the boat I've abandoned, on the shore I've abandoned my small boat. Now with you I will seek other seas. Let us pray. O oh, loving, forgiving, renewing, creating God, made known to us in Christ and given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, we call upon you this day to kindly smile on us. We know that we struggle, O oh God. We know that arrogance is something that we all do. We know that we are inherently judgy, and yet we also know from the teachings of Jesus that your judgment on us, you who could judge us anyway, you have judged us with love. And so fill our hearts with your love. Fill our hearts with your judgment of other people. Help us to look upon one another in the most favorable and the kindest way instead of in the most critical. Help us to give one another and ourselves the benefit of the doubt so that we may discover your love. We may discover your way. We may discover our worth in this world. We pray that you will take away from us the arrogance that makes us always compare us to one, ourselves to one another and instead give us the gifts of faith and hope and love, but especially love. In that spirit of love, O oh God, we pray for all the people in this world who are in places that cause them to be the last and the least. We pray for the poor and the hungry, the homeless, the helpless, the hopeless. We pray for the refugees from natural disasters, from flooding, from hurricane, from fire, from famine, from earthquake, from political unrest, from economic unrest, from all of the things that cause people to feel they need to abandon the life they have had and hope for something better. Oh God, we are all refugees in some way as we come before you, refugees from our own self-judgment, refugees from our sense that the world is not enough, refugees and helpless and hopeless when we try to work our own salvation, refugees hoping that you will open the door and welcome us in, not as strangers or guests, but as your beloved children. We pray for all of those this day who are sick, those who are ailing, those who are seeking treatments, those who are awaiting diagnosis, those who are undergoing procedures, those who are hoping against hope that the last thing will work, those who have learned they will have to live with new realities, those who are rounding the corner into death. God, we are so frail. We are so weak. Our medicine and our miracles of modern science have caused us sometimes to think we are eternal, but we are not. At least our bodies are not. And so lift us up in the eternal parts of our souls and the energy that is never destroyed and hold us close to you, especially when we are sick, especially when we are dying. And hold even closer those who grieve the loss of people whom they have loved. We know from Christ that we will be reunited in your love, but the separation is hard for us, O oh God. And so wipe away tears, comfort grieving hearts, and hold us close so that we may understand what it is to go on living and loving, even when our world is shattered, even when that which we treasured most has left us, even when we feel that we have nothing left to offer. God, teach us to offer our exhaustion, to offer our will, to offer our lovingness, to offer a work of our hands, to offer our small boats that we try to pilot through these giant stormy seas, Help us to see that our small efforts on behalf of one another combine in your love to great efforts on behalf of the whole world. Bless your church and all churches and all congregations of any sort that do your work in the world, that feed the hungry, that house the homeless, that care for the helpless and hopeless and refugee. And show us how we may do that too, not in our arrogance, coming with a small bit of what we have, but instead in our lovingness, recognizing one another as we look upon each other. Help us to see that we are all made in your image and help us to recognize your image in each and every person we encounter, even the one who cuts us off in traffic, even the one who does something that we think is unspeakably and unforgivably horrible, even the one that we don't care to know, even the one, God, 
that sometimes we think we might hate. Help us to understand your way of love where there is no room for hate. Open our eyes that have been clouded by the fog of knowing too much to begin to know one another better. Give us wisdom to use the tools of this world, the social media, the computers, so many things wisely for the uplifting of one another. And God, we thank you. We thank you for the beauty of this world and of its people, and we thank you for your love, your everlasting, gracious love, your love that will not let us go, your love that forgives us and finds us even in our arrogance and our rudeness and our jealousy, your love that will transform us into your people. We pray all these things in the name of the one who has come to show us the way, Jesus, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope that you will be moved by this time together to go forth and re-examine the times when you have gotten pleasure from knowing that you were better from, than somebody and think about the ways that we might, so we all might substitute and each of us and every one of us and all of us together might substitute instead the knowing that we are one with everyone else, that we are not better than, that we are not worse than, that we are not victims of delusion, but instead that we are agents of your love in this world. And so, as you go forth, I hope that you will live in love and peace and joy. Spread that love as thickly as you can and go in peace until we meet again.